That song really does say it all. I mean, sometimes we think about need as a form of weakness, but need really, it's an acknowledgement. The fact that why would we not acknowledge the fact our need of God when God offers so wonderfully to provide for us, to take care of us, and to show us a much better way. If you have your copy of God's Word this morning, we're going to be back in the book of Mark. We've been slowly making our way through this awesome story of the good news. We'll be Mark chapter 12. We'll begin with verse 28 when we, when we get there. And so people, have you noticed, will argue about all sorts of different things. We will argue about which pickup truck is the best. We will argue about which sports ball team is the best. Some will even argue about, well, which imaginary superhero is the best. And while all those things seem really inconsequential, consider that we also argue over which Mexican restaurant is the best. Barbecue? Absolutely. Brands of ketchup? In some families, that's fighting words. Sometimes we will use our words like a live grenade, and we just kind of toss it into a conversation just to see what kind of chaos will actually happen. And yet, and yet we will go silent when talking about the things of God, the things that absolutely matter the most. This morning, we're going to hear about a guy that just wanted to argue with Jesus. But politely, lovingly, he had the tables turned on him for the better. So I'm not suggesting that we pick indiscriminate fights over or with God's word. But for argument's sake, what I am suggesting is that we consider examining our attitude, examine our actions to help others follow Jesus and see if we, if we too need to better follow Jesus. Let's go to him in prayer and ask him to speak to us today. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for this day, God. We do need you. I do need you. And God, I pray that as we look at your truth today, that you will show us our need for you and your willingness to not just to supply it, but to give it to us in abundance. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So historically, as we've been making our way through the book of Mark, Mark wants us to see the significance of the last week of Jesus' life. That's where we're at right now. He is in Jerusalem. Jesus came to the temple on a Sunday, and he did amongst a great celebration. On Monday, Jesus came back to Jerusalem. He cleansed the temple. And with his return on Tuesday, Jesus went to the court of the Gentiles, the most outer part of the temple, and brought to light the rejection of the work of God by the religious leaders who should have been affirming it, should have been speaking about it. Jesus then further walked into the temple and he shared this parable, a story with a point that prompted them to examine their own lives. And what it did is it left those who were willing to accept his promise with something marvelous to look forward to. If they heeded his words, there would be this marvelous promise. But to those who rejected his truth, well, it was going to leave them with an understanding of their own guilt, not anything that was imposed upon them, but that which they willingly chose themselves. The elders, they have attempted already to discredit Jesus with a question about their taxes and their allegiance. The Sadducees have tried to humiliate Jesus with a most absurd question about the resurrection and about eternal life. And now the, the scribes, well, they're going to attempt to thwart Jesus with a long-standing debate about the law and how we are to live our life. So where the elders used what looked like an apparent contradiction, the Sadducees were looking for an excuse to just dismiss him. The scribes now are going to argue with Jesus just for the sake of it, just to pick a fight, just to cause a scene, just to see if they can get him to slip up or trip him up, all in an attempt to cancel him in front of everybody. And so this is what Mark writes, beginning in verse 28 of chapter 12. He says, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing. That would have been that previous conversation with the Sadducees. And recognizing that he had answered them well, he asked him, 
What commandment is the foremost of all? And so Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and that you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then the second one, now I can just kind of add this in for good measure, is that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And so the scribe says to him, right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and then there is no one besides him. I like that. You know, the scribe here, you know, he's not acknowledging it yet, but I mean, he's telling the creator of the universe, oh, hey, you answered that question correctly. How about that? The words that you inspired to be said, you knew what to say. But he goes on, he says, you know, there's no one besides him. And to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all the burnt offerings and all the sacrifices. And so when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. So what's the point about God that we need to see this morning? What's the theological truth or the thing that we need to understand? Mark wants us to see that our attitude and our actions are needed to follow Jesus. Okay? It takes both. It takes what's on our inside, our commitments, our willingness, our desire, our choice, but yet it also takes us willing to do something with that. Not just something we say, not just something we keep inside and say, oh yeah, I believe, but something that we say that if we believe, we are willing to do. And so while the scribes are seeking to defame Jesus with their question after the failure of the elders and the Sadducees, Jesus uses their question to share how anyone can live for God. So they were trying to trip him up, and now Jesus is going to turn it and say, hey, with my answer, I'm going to show you and you and you and you how you can follow after God and to do so correctly. And so this is what Jesus starts out with. Jesus says it's about priority. It's about priority. The word foremost lets us know that God is to be chief more important, or what comes first. That's what we get from that word foremost, okay? And so he is to be what comes first in our life, so that when Jesus says, the Lord our God is one, it means that God is to be first in all things. That's the priority part. And so you need to ask yourself and consider this morning, is God primary in all things in your life? Does he have first place? Does he get first choice? And then when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, it means that God is to totally encompass all your ways. So it's not just that he is to be primary, right? That's first. It means that he's also to be all-inclusive, okay? He gets consideration in all things that we do, not just the big things, not just the problems, but yet he is to have a primary consideration. These quotes are from the writings of Moses in Deuteronomy. And so if you want to go back and look where Jesus is talking from, he's talking from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And they reveal that there is to be an inner attitude, if you noticed, and outward actions. See, the words heart, soul, mind, strength, their definitions, they all kind of overlap just a little bit. And they, they give us their meaning that it drives home this idea that Jesus is to be your priority. If so, you will have a desire given by God 
that is now a part of you. That's that heart idea that God has given you a desire. It's a part of you. It can't be separated. Your desire from him is a part of who you are if he's your priority. Not just that, but this priority, this desire moves you to conclusively from thought to deed, all right? So if he is this primary idea and this driving desire, this desire is not going to remain a thought. If it's so primary, it's going to become an action. You aren't going to be able not to do that. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's like when you desire something and you're going, I'm going to do that. I'm going to accomplish that. But God turns up the volume to 11, all right? He says that if I am that drive in your life, it is going to come out. And so as it does become this outward action, it's unstoppable in fashion. It impacts every Thing that you do so that when God is your priority, there is this inner drive that drives you to act. It becomes consuming and it impacts everything that's going on in your life. Jesus doesn't just want to have your heart. He doesn't just want to change you. He wants you to be a part of his change for the better in all of the world. All right? It's like Jesus made early on in his ministry, does one light a light, right? And then cover it up so it's worthless? No, you lift it up high so that it can be seen and it illuminates everything. That's what our life is supposed to be. And when Jesus is our priority, then that's the way that we live. And so it's not just, though, about priority. Jesus says it's also about providing. What is it that we're supposed to do with this desire, right? What is this we're supposed to do with this passion that comes out in our actions and deeds that's supposed to have this impact, right? How do we know what to do and where that goes? The word love describes an inner attitude and an outward action, all right? When God says you are to love all right, love's not just a, a gushy gushy feeling. It's also a verb that we are to act with, right? And so this word love talks about preferring God's ways, embracing God's ways, choosing to live them out towards other people. So if we do love, then what we do is we embrace his ways because they are good, right? And then we choose to live that kind of action out in all people. We don't just pick the certain people we want to love, right? That's kind of easy, but we are called to love all people. You mean people who are different? Yeah. People who are di you mean people who act ugly? Yeah. You mean people who act, you act like I used to act? Yes, yes. We are to love people just like that. So that when Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, it's not about doing for others as you would like. All right? Sometimes we think about that. Well, I love other people the way I want to be loved. But you notice the focus there is on who? It's on us, right? I will love you the way I want to be loved, and I'm glad that you're willing to accept and acknowledge all that. No, no, no. When you love your neighbor as yourself, remember the word love means to embrace God's ways, his preferences, and then to share it. So to love our neighbor as ourself means we love as God directs other people, right? Not just the way we want to be loved because, hey, we're selfish, right? Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme more. But God's saying, no, love the way I loved you because God's love is not selfish. He loved us even when we didn't deserve it, right? And so this quote from the writings of Moses, it's from the book of Leviticus. And I know you're thinking, Leviticus, right? It's everyone's favorite book in the Bible. You love to quote the book of Leviticus, said no one ever. But yet, this passage here in Leviticus 19 is an amazing thing, and Jesus quotes from it on purpose. This quote provides the context and the definition of what it means to love others as yourself. So isn't it amazing that God tells us, hey, you need to do this. And by the way, you might be thinking, ooh, love others as I want to be loved. Sure. He goes, well, I, here, 
I've already told you what that means. Isn't it cool that the Bible tells us to do something and then tells us how to do it and what it looks like, and we don't have to grope in the dark and kind of figure it out? So what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? I'm glad you asked, because here's where it goes. Here we are told that providing for others includes what we say, it includes what we do, and it includes what we think. All right? That's how we are to provide for them. So God declares this in Leviticus 19, that we are not to take advantage of others, that we are not to deceive them, that we are not to be untruthful. So to love others, right, our neighbors, means we don't do those things. God proclaims that we are not to be abusive to others, that we're not to oppress them, that we're not to discredit them, right? That means we're not to rob or take things secretly from them that we are not to withhold what is right. Now, that one's interesting, isn't it? That's a passive idea, not withhold what is right. In fact, in the, in the book of Leviticus, the way it's quoted there is that you are not to withhold from a person their wages overnight. The idea was as they've, they've worked that day, you give them what is due at the end of that, instead of saying, I'll give it to you later. But you know, if we're not careful, we're kind of passive like that, are we not? Sometimes we withhold what's right because we use it for leverage for something else. But that's not a godly way. That's a worldly way. God then announces that we are not to mock others. Okay, the word is slander, but the idea is that we're not to mock or belittle. And I know, man, our world does that a lot. In fact, I mean, we created a whole genre of stuff called memes just to mock and make fun of people, right? We take video, we slap words on it, and we pass it on because, ah, it's funny. And sometimes we go, but oh, they deserve it because look what they're doing. Ah, mm, don't argue with me. And so we're not to mock them. We're not to be cruel, okay? That's to act against life. We're not to be cruel to people. We're not to bear grudges in hate. So that means we are to forgive even when they haven't asked for it, even when they don't deserve it. Because God forgave you, right? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for you. Before we ever said, oh, I want him. Before we ever knew of him. And so we extend it. This is what it means to provide. This is what it means to serve. Because ultimately, this is what God wants. He wants us to speak rightly and correct when necessary. So sometimes that means we're encouraging, right? That's rightly and correct. But do you realize also speaking rightly and correct also means that we reprove? Now, no one likes to do that, right? Because you go, okay, what's reprove? Well, that means pointing out that there's something better for you to be doing, and what you're doing right now is not good for you. Not because I say it, not because it's my opinion, but because what? God's Word says something different. So now that I've pointed out, hey, there's this thing that you, you, know, you need to address, let me tell you about the coolness and the, of God and how he wants to help and encourage you to be better instead of just rubbing your face in your mistake, right? God tells us we are to be that way. God tells us this too, that we are to give to the needy and the stranger from our own labors. All right, sometimes, man, we're willing to do that, and we want somebody else to do that. But here's the word picture that Moses writes about in the book of Leviticus. He says that when you go out to harvest your field, you do not harvest the corners. You leave the corners of your field as they were for the alien and the stranger. Now, interesting thing here, he's not talking about just giving straight out hands out. Because if they are left unharvested, they're still going to have to be harvested, right? But he has provided a means for someone else who has need to come and be satisfied, right? 
That is a sacrifice to the farmer, is it not? That is profit and sustenance for their own family that God is telling them to leave. But he doesn't just stop there. He says that you're also supposed to leave the gleanings. That is the stuff that as after you've gathered it all up in the bushels and stuff, the stuff that's still on the ground, he's telling you, hey, you don't need to go pick that back up again. Leave that for people who are even of greater need, who maybe can't go harvest the corners, but they need something immediately. And so God calls us to give of ourselves and sacrifice of ourselves from what God has provided us, right? We might have planted it, we might have tended it, but who provided it ultimately? God. So God has provided all of our resources, our jobs, our way to get there, everything that we have. And he says to love our neighbor as ourself, we need to what? We need to sacrifice from what God has given us. He then ultimately tells us that we need to guard our minds so that we don't let sin derail us from showing love to others. There's a lot of stuff in the world. Is everything in the world bad? No. Is some things in the world better than others? Absolutely. And so God tells us to guard this because what you might not believe it because we have a hard time pulling it back up, but everything that goes in here stays in here and it's available to us. Sometimes as we get older, it's harder to pull it back up right when we want it, but it doesn't go anywhere. And so we need to protect it, right? Because what we think becomes what we do. And if we think on the good things of God, what are we going to do? The good things of God. If we think about things that are in opposition to God, we will do things that are in opposition to God. We will do wrong. We will. And so he's telling us to guard our minds. Along with these words in the chapter 19 of the book of Leviticus, God says, I am the Lord. He says it five different times. So there's a grouping. I am the Lord. Another grouping of words. I am the Lord. So let me ask you a question. What do you think it means as God is saying, this is how you love your neighbor and oh, by the way, I am the Lord? What does that mean? It means it's important, right? He says it once, that's it. He says it twice, it's like pay attention, right? He says it the third, the fourth, and the fifth time. Do you think maybe that God is being serious that this is the way we are to love other people? Oh, by the way, I am the Lord your God. I'm telling you this is how it's supposed to happen right? I, I, I'm encouraged by this. I don't look at that and get upset because there are many times that someone tells me something, sometimes my wife, and it's like, oh, you never said that. I don't remember that ever, right? And you're looking at me like, you guys don't even know what I'm talking about. Shame on you. You all know what I'm talking about. But yet God says, hey, I'm the Lord. <laughs> Pay attention. Remember, this is how we provide for others, so here we're going to wrap it all up today. Mark practically wants us to change our attitude and actions to follow Jesus. If attitude and action is important, then we should let God do with it what's best, right? I mean, that's what we're called to do. And so the scribes, he actually agrees with Jesus. Do you remember that? He stated that there is no one but one true God, and to love God requires more than the minimum sacrifices, right? So that means that to love God is, well, it's more than showing up in church on Sunday morning and sitting in a pew. It's even more than, hey, I went to Bible study. It's even more than, hey, I'm helping with vacation Bible school, right? It's a way of life. And, and so this scribe, you know, he, he, he gets this. Jesus replies, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. So what's going on here? This scribe is so close to love God, him only, right? To love God, you know, other people the way God says. But Jesus says, hey, you're so close. Wouldn't it be awful to have that realization and stop? 
how many of you, maybe today, will say, oh yeah, God's good. Oh yeah, I need to be providing and doing for other people. And you stop. You've made some sort of acknowledgement, but nothing else happens. Man, don't be like that today. Don't be like that at all. See, what you do is you need to realize that Jesus is that one true God. See, the scribe said, hey, there's only one God. And he said, hey, we're supposed to love this way. But he wasn't quite to the point of saying that Jesus was the promised one that he needed to give his life to. And so maybe you think, oh, yeah, God's good. I've heard about him. Oh, yeah, we need to treat other people good. But is Jesus the one true God of your life? Is he the Savior of your life? Because see, what Jesus says, and it looks like an odd ending to the story, is he talks about how David, quoted from the book of Psalms, talked about how he referred to his son as Lord. And so why would Jesus, I mean, David be saying, my Lord said to my Lord, Well, what he's pointing out is that David's descendant was going to be the promised one, right? The Messiah. And so Jesus is saying that next step that must be taken is acknowledging that Jesus is the promised one of God, that he is the one true God, and that if we don't say yes to him, acknowledge that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes unto the Father but through him, then we have gotten right to the point and stopped acknowledge the truth, and missed out on everything else. And so this morning, I want you to make sure you're not stopping short. Who runs a race to see the finish line and go, mm, I don't want to go there. Let Jesus be the Lord of your life. And so today, if you've never asked him to save you, today you can. You can ask him to save you from your sin and to help you to live rightly and to follow him best decision I've ever made. We're going to celebrate baptism of one that says that's exactly what's happened, and she's going to follow in obedience, telling you her story that she has died to her old way of life, that she is a new person because of Jesus, and that we have a responsibility to help her follow Jesus. That's what baptism is all about. It doesn't save us. It just gives us the means to tell the story. Maybe your story starts today. And so I'm going to pray in just a moment. And when I do, if you realize you need God's salvation, come forward and talk to me. And let's talk about what God can do for you. Lastly, maybe you are a Jesus person already. You need to serve others because of God. You don't serve because you got to. You don't serve because, well, if I don't, it looks bad, right? You serve because you want to. You get to. It's a privilege. Does that mean to serve God, you got to work in VBS? No, no, it doesn't. Does it mean you got to go to Falls Creek as a sponsor? No, no, it doesn't. Are there lots of different ways that you can provide for others with the good news of Jesus? Man, there are more than I can count. But we need to make sure that it's not all up here, that it becomes out here, that we do stuff with it. The scribe did not realize that everybody was his neighbor, right? I mean, isn't that the story that we get from when Jesus previously had talked about the Good Samaritan? Who is my neighbor? Everybody is to be our neighbor, all right? That we are to speak and to do for everyone so that everyone can benefit from the good things of God. Awesome to see you here today. There are many who are not here today that need to be encouraged, that need to be helped, right? That's what God calls us to do. That's how we provide for others. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to have a moment of prayer, this invitation that I've talked about where I want to invite you to follow Jesus. Maybe you just need to come forward and pray, and and you want to ask God to help you with something. Maybe there's something I can encourage you with. Maybe you need to be saved Whatever it is today, let God work and do something amazing in your life. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for this day, God. Let us all leave here with you being our first and primary priority. 
Let us all, God, be willing to love others to, as you have loved us. God, let our attitude and our actions be right, and let us not leave here until that is the case. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.